Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about the fairly rare but very dangerous fungal causes of brain infection. So essentially um, central nervous system infections caused by fungi. Um, in this case I'm listing it as meningitis and encephalitis but that's not truly the whole story because we also do see um, abscess formation in the brain as a result of fungus um, and typically when we're seeing fungal infections in the brain it's really the result of fungemia. So essentially fungal growth um, or fungi that have escaped from wherever the initial infection was and passed through the bloodstream. I'm going to talk about kind of some general infections up front, but what this video is really going to focus on at the end is Cryptococcus neoformans. Um, this is actually a really important uh, cause of central nervous system infections caused by fungi. Um, it's particularly dangerous in the immunosuppressed community, um, and so we're going to spend a lot of time in the video talking about that. All right, so fungal infections of the CNS are really not very common at all. They're actually a fairly rare occurrence. When they occur, it's typically in an immunocompromised patient. Specifically, the HIV and AIDS community have been most significantly affected by fungal infections specifically cryptococcus, which we'll address at the end of the video. Typically, fungal infections um, of the brain manifest as um, kind of a meningitis um, symptoms. So we'll talk about the symptoms some more, but essentially it's similar symptoms to what you would see with bacterial meningitis, just it's a, a different um, cause. The other thing that we see a lot with fungal agents when we see them um, is actually abscess formation, particularly some of the fungi that we're going to talk about are very angio-invasive. So essentially they kind of go into the bloodstream as almost like a little fungal bolus, and then they migrate to the brain and kind of set up camp in one structure. Um, Aspergillus is particularly known for this because it's highly angio-invasive. Um, so it's essentially getting to the brain using hematogenous spread, um, so it's associated with fungemia, and then it lands in the brain and grows there. Um, very, very occasionally, they will actually spread to the brain via direct extension. Um, normally that happens when we have fungal infections of the skin or the sinuses, um, and that can lead to a mixture of acute chronic or granulomatous inflammation. Um, we certainly saw that with um, blastomyces when we talked about that in um, your cystic fibrosis case. Um, and you can actually check out my video on blastomyces if you have questions about that. But that's one of the organisms that's known to cause some sinopulmonary um, infections that then can spread um, via um, direct extension to the brain. The other thing that I'm just going to talk about briefly, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on, is how you actually treat um, fungal infections of the brain. And kind of the answer is these high-dose antifungals. Now, you're going to have high-dose antifungals, and you're going to have them for a very long period of time. Um, at this point in the curriculum, we haven't really discussed treatment of HIV, but when you're dealing with a patient who has the potential to become severely immunosuppressed, you also have to think about what you can treat them for prophylactically. And one of the things that we worry about are parasitic and fungal infections that can be very, very um, dangerous in this community. So some, of, some patients, you'll actually put them on these antifungals for long periods of time just to protect them should they come um, in contact with them or should they have some sort of latent infection. So I'm going to talk about each of the causative agents just a little bit more to remind you. So aspergillus, like I said, we talked about this actually in Nicole McNeil, um, which was the asthma case in the vital gases block. Um, and the reason we talked about it is that aspergillus can actually also lead to kind of an asthma-like response response um, and is actually an, a, a, an organism of concern in asthmatics and cystic fibrosis patients and other people with underlying lung conditions. Um, it's one of the most common and invasive mold infections worldwide. It's found ubiquitously. Um, we find it in the soil, we find it um, in the water, we find it, um, it's a saprobe, so we find it in actually um, dying vegetation. Um, so it's kind of an equal opportunity offender in where it hangs out. It's an opportunistic a pathogen of cystic fibrosis patients, asthma patients, um, and the immunocompromised, um, which is true of all of the organisms that I'm going to talk about today. So I'm not really going to write that one down.
Remember that it also has um, a septate branching hyphae. Okay, so septate meaning we have these little separations along the hyphae that look like individual cells and that it branches at acute angles. So that's one way you can visualize it. If it looks kind of like a plant stalk with different cell walls and an acute angle in tissue, then you might have aspergillus. It's highly aerobic, which makes sense because when we think about the organisms or the um, patients that it causes disease in, it's patients with respiratory issues so it likes to grow in our lungs and as I mentioned before it's highly highly angio invasive which means it wants to get into your bloodstream and go elsewhere um, because it's so angio invasive um, it has a really um, good ability to spread hematogenously and go to extra pulmonary sites and so this will actually lead to multi multiple what we call septic emboli forming so it's just like you know, an emboli that you would form, except it's septic because it's caused by an organism. The septic emboli travel through the blood to the brain where you'll see the abscess formation. Um, and you can see tons of them all over. And I'll actually show you one in a minute that was caused by aspergillus. Mortality of this one, despite specific antifungal therapy, is upwards of 70%. So if this one gets to the brain, it's really, really dangerous. Um, we diagnose it using silver stain in the mycology lab. So that's all I'm going to say about aspergillus. We're going to move on to candida. Um, we've discussed candida kind of here and there. Um, it's a really, really common fungal infection. We see it all the time in all sorts of different body sites. Um, it's often associated with yeast infections, particularly in women. It's also associated with oral thrush, which we see in HIV patients, but we also see it in nursing infants, um, where there can actually be um, transmission back and forth from the nursing mother to the infant. Um, and it can be really, really difficult. It's an oval yeast form. Um, so most of the time we see it in its yeast form. Um, and it's one of the most important groups of opportunistic pathogens. It's found all over the world. And here's the fun thing, about 25 to 50% of humans are actually just carriers of it. We just have it anyway. Um, it is a huge cause of bloodstream infections. It's actually the third most common bloodstream infection. So back when we talked about um, cardiac valve infections, you know, we certainly talked about staph and we talked about some of the streps and we talked about the HASIC organisms and the gram-negative organisms. Well, this is the third most common cause right after gram-negative organisms. So it's actually a really important um, organism. The other reason it's important is that we're seeing building drug resistance. So the candida organisms have multi-drug resistance. In fact, um, one of the organisms that's been in the news a lot recently is C. Which has been isolated from several patients who have died, um, and it is a candida organism, and it appears to be resistant to almost everything. So this is a very um, significant cause of um, hospital-based um, infection that we're watching closely. Um, it can be diagnosed in a couple of different ways. It doesn't actually produce hyphae; it produces what we call pseudo hyphae. Um, so that's one way you can visualize it, but there's also germ tube tests and you can look using H&E staining, PAS, and GMS stains. So there's a lot of different options for how you can diagnose candida. Um, they are incredibly important um, and we do see them go to the brain. So the predominant source of candida infection is actually an endogenous infection. So essentially a patient has it at a mucosal or cutaneous site and then it spreads hematogenously to another place. This normally happens when normal commensal host flora are able to spread. So in the case of Canada, this occurs when host immunity is lower. Um, we can also see exogenous transmission occur when contaminated irrigation solutions are used or nutritional fluids, um, vascular pressure inducers, cardiac valves, or corneas are used. So any sort of contamination. And because it's very difficult to kill, hospitals are kind of full of Canada. Um, it's a it's a very significant fear, um, particularly in, t in intensive care units where you have patients that are already very ill. Um, so we have to worry about it kind of as a hospital infection. Um, any patient that has candida is actually at a twofold higher risk of death than patients without candida. So it's something we have to really consider. We'll discuss a lot of clinical syndromes associated with candida in later cases, but CNS candidiasis may occur where it actually resembles bacterial meningitis 
or the course may be kind of indolent or chronic, but either way, once it gets into the brain, it's very difficult to treat. And like I said, there is a higher risk of mortality. Okay, so that's candida. We're gonna move on to histoplasma, coccidioides, and blastomyces, which we covered all together in your Zadie Johnson uh, cystic fibrosis case. So histoplasma, this is the causative agent of histoplasmosis. It's endemic to kind of the eastern half of the United States. So just think the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. We also see it sometimes in Latin America. The yeast form of histoplasma is typically an intracellular organism, but we can see a yeast form both intracellularly and extracellularly in a sample biopsy. It causes pulmonary infections that then disseminate. When it comes to the CNS, it can lead to death within two to 24 months. So what does that tell you? It's a bit slow growing. It's a little indolent, right? So it's going to take a little while, but then um, once it gets going, it's kind of difficult to treat and get rid of because you might not track it down right away. Um, it's diagnosed by direct micro microscopy. You can see it pretty clearly. or a culture of the blood or bone marrow or some other clinical specimen. Um, and you can see it using either serology or antigen detection in blood or urine. And you can also use GEMSA, GMS, and PAS stains. Okay, coccidioides. Again, another one from your cystic fibrosis case. Um, this is an inhalation disease. So essentially you inhaled the organism and then it causes everything from kind of an asymptomatic infection to death. Um, so the majority of the infections are actually found in California. So we actually don't worry about this one too much where we are. Um, typically it's travel cases or people who spent time there for, you know, to get away from our horrible weather and then come back. Um, it causes coccidiomycosis, which normally causes like a flu-like illness. You get fever, cough, chest pain, weight loss. And then some patients also get kind of this allergic reaction known as erythematous macular rash um, or erythema nodosum. Um, certain ethnic groups seem to have kind of a higher um, propensity for this one. Um, Filipino, African American, Native American, Hispanic, they seem to run the highest risk of dissemination and particularly meningitis. So when we see um, coccidiomycosis in these populations, we do tend to see a higher risk of meningitis. What causes that? I don't know. It's just kind of the epidemiology behind it. Um, we also see a higher risk of it in men than women becoming disseminated, but when women are pregnant, we have to worry about it more. Also, this is one of those ones that if you have a patient that's on a TNF inhibitor, you're going to... Um, want to watch out for it because this is one of those ones that seems to be really well controlled by TNF inhibitors so or TNF. So if you have a patient on a TNF inhibitor, it puts them at higher risk for coxie. Um, the mortality in this um, instance when a patient has disseminated to the CNS coccidioides is upwards of 90% um, without treatment. Um, and chronic infection is pretty common. So this one is one that we definitely want to find, hunt down, and treat. Okay, blastomyces. Unlike coccidioides, blastomyces is definitely one that we see. Um, blasto and histo are pretty common in the Midwest. It's confined largely to the Mississippi River Basin, that's blastomyces, and around the Great Lakes. And you know, as I sit mere miles from one of the Great Lakes, it's easy to remember this one. Um, you get long septate hyphae, so very similar to what I was saying with aspergillus. Um, and it's characterized though by this broad-based budding. Um, I think that's one of the best ways to remember this one is kind of its unique budding um, pattern. Um, most patients with pulmonary blastomycosis are either going to be asymptomatic or have kind of a mild flu-like illness, but you get more severe infection when a patient has bacterial pneumonia. And just like aspergillus, it can invade the, um, the bloodstream and then spread extra pulmonary where it reaches the brain.